This week's podcast is a specific podcast that's just dedicated to one particular topic. Uh, and it's a topic that uh, we decided to do. We've had a fair bit of interest in it. And Mark has mentioned this a few times in a few sort of different scenarios. And people have instantly raised their eyebrows up and said, oh, hang on a minute. Can you tell us a little bit more? So it is a little bit um, not and controversial is the wrong word to use. But um, it is talking about a subject that some people might feel slightly uncomfortable with. It is a subject all on pressure. And the reason that we're doing this um, has been spurred on from a a lovely comment from one of our online members, Abby. And she wrote to us a few weeks ago and she just she said, I'll read you what she said. I just wanted to reach out and say a massive thank you for making your podcast available. I've literally learned so much from binge listening the whole content and I'm very excited to join your video classroom. I haven't attended your clinics as a participant yet as I was very loyally following another trainer who she has great respect for. But she says um, this trainer somehow has missed the concept of adding pressure to help a horse cope with pressure. So she's gone to a Harry Whitney clinic um, which she did a a a while ago and she thinks she can sort of see the um the crossover between what you're teaching mark and what she learned at the harry whitney clinic which is that the rain can indeed be a comfort and what directing a horse's thought looks like so from that mark i just wondered if you might be able to talk to us um in this session about the concept of adding pressure um and how it can actually help a horse how it can help a horse deal with pressure and how you know and why they need to be able to cope with it but first of all um i just wondered if you might be able to just talk to us about directing a horse's thought what what is that what does it look like why do you do it yeah well actually um just to as i go on to directing horses thoughts you know um going you know harry whitney uh so originally well on my little quest to sort of try to operate horses better um i was at a stage that I was teaching Pullerful to not push horses away and finding out ways to try and direct horses to make them feel a bit better about the application of pressure and horses feeling good about being asked questions of us that, you know, sometimes could make them feel bad, uh, which in most commonly I saw a lot of horses feeling really bad. And and over the, the years of sort of starting to sort of change the way I was doing things and, and starting to teach people how to, you know, create a better learning environment for horses and I also came across Ross Jacobs who is a, a follower of also Harry Whitney and and his writings and things like that and that that really got me sort of it was really good because I met someone I was like oh he's, he doesn't drive horses he's all about directing horses and and then he was talking a lot about directing horses thoughts and that also later on led me to sort of going to America to watch Harry Whitney uh, myself to watch him and I only was there for five days to watch him, but it was it was really nice to watch him um, work and and apply pressure that horses would find softness through, and um, and the clarity in directing them through the reins and directing their thoughts was was you know he did he did really well, and and it was good to watch that. And um, and I guess um, when I first ever started doing clinics. Um, people were applying pressure but the horses were troubled by it like I saw a lot of horsemanship that was telling people to apply pressure but I saw a lot of troubled horses and you know trying to figure out why and then um going back to you know the first question just that that, that you just mentioned Jenny um you know what is directing a horse's thought well the reason horses are troubled by pressure is of course they're not going towards their thoughts they are uh, then they're disempowered by not able to to um, make a decision and act on that decision. So, you know, shutting down or shutting out, you know, all those sort of helpless situations a horse is in, it's just the feeling that they're not able to act on their thoughts uh, and especially under pressure. And that's when, when they sort of, um, that's when the horses um, freeze or, uh, you know, lose desire the most or, or have too much desire is when they're under pressure. So. So a horse going towards his thoughts is something where a horse is actively making a decision. And it's really simple in the sense of explanation is if I put pressure uh, on, say, for instance, in a basic situation, a common thing you see people do on the ground is they'll put the stick on one side and they want the horse to go away from the stick. 
whether it's a hind quarter, fore quarter, whether it's setting on a circle, whatever, and you watch the horse look at the stick as it's looking at the stick, it moves all four to feet away, and it keeps focusing on where the stick is to gauge where it needs to be to move off pressure. Now, it's, a, it's, it's really easy to get a response out of a horse doing that, but if you look at the horse's mind, the horse is looking at the pressure the whole time, focused on the pressure, and it's moving away from the pressure. Whereas if you put the stick on the right side of the horse, so even if you use the same concept and you didn't get him to look through a feel of a rope or something like that, um, you know, because I've seen Ross and Harry, and I've done it myself, where I've used pressure on one side of a horse to get it to, to search to the other side. And that is kind of almost like blind Freddie on the hill might say, oh, he's using driving pressure. But the, di the difference is, is the horse is actually, one horse is staring at the pressure, looking for where it is, slightly worrying about it, and then going, oh, I've got to move away from that. Whereas the other horse sees the pressure and goes, hmm, where can I look? And then they start to look and then go towards their thoughts. So you watch them feel a lot better when they actually go, yep, I'm going to go towards my thoughts. And by going towards their thoughts, they've got their secondary focus on possibly where the pressure came from or us. And they're thinking about where they're going. So their mind is on what they're doing and where they're going. So they're constantly able to regulate their anxiety better. So basically, but the basis of it is, is the horse fixated on the pressure or is it traveling towards its thoughts? Is it thinking in that direction? Has it let go of, you know, a forward thought? And is it thinking backwards when I pull the right rein? Has it let go of the left idea of going left through its outside eye or zoning out to its mates over there? Has it let go of that thought? And is it, brought its thoughts and continued to follow that rein by, by going to the right with its thoughts and, and looking for the new uh, pathway to the right. So really, that's really directing a horse's thoughts. Is it is it travelling towards its thoughts? Um, so that's why I say they're moving away from pressure. Or so so let's go on then with, with that uh, topic. How, how do you add pressure in the right way so that you can help a horse? Well... So what, what, I, what I talk about is I talk about, um, you know, you know, we're not fine, you know, when a, when a really troubled horse comes in, it's had, you know, years of trauma from pressure and things like that. Um, sometimes the nice idea is just to back away and just to, let's all have a cup of tea and let the horse relax. And, but the, the horses don't, like they don't handle trauma well and it's getting them to uh, act under, under pressure or through trauma. Uh, and find answers that, that helps them, in, that empowers them. So um, applying pressure is an interesting thing and it will create a negative response in a horse in a lot of cases, especially the ones that have had a lot of trauma. But what happens is it's in searching and finding an answer that helps them feel better. So, and people kind of think that horses you know, you, you back off and you get them into a certain, they, 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 re, they relax and then you can educate them when they're relaxed. Um, but if you look at horses in the wild, there's a lot of times there's conflict in the herd. Uh, there's conflict in the wild herd. You know, there's, there's uh, times they have to jump in flooded rivers to cross flooded rivers. There's all sorts of things that horses do out in the wild that require, a, you know, some form of uh, I'm stressed, but I'm going to think my way through this because the end result is going to be better than staying stressed here. So how a horse works in the wild is to deal with pressure, it, it does something, okay? If, if horses would all shut down in the wild, then they'd all be dead by now. We wouldn't have any horses because before humans, you know, they would have been hunted out by, I don't know, uh, say because kind of years was. ago. Mm. Yeah. So so the reason horses and zebras and everything, you know, survived when they, before they were sort of... Um, uh, domesticated, I suppose, then, then they survive through making decisions for themselves. And, and I see so many horses that are so able to make decisions. And in our training, sometimes we take that right off them and then they're, 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 they're potentially, um, you know, uh, disempowered through, through lack of uh, change of thought, lack of desire, lack of finding answers. You know, uh, they've lost all their... Um, um, curiosity and all that sort of stuff purely because they just think, oh, you know, it's learned helplessness, you know, and they're the horses that move off pressure. And so when someone comes in and says, well, I'm going to just take the pressure off the horse and let it relax and then ask it the question. Well, I say, well, how are you going to ask it the question? Are you going to add pressure to ask a question? This horse has no desire left, um, you know, because it's or because of pressure. So, um, so yeah, so basically how we, when, when we add pressure to horses, um, you know, so if I've got a traumatic horse, it's 
frozen, I'll add pressure and it, and it might get slightly worried. But in its worry, I'll see that mine start to search a little bit. And it might even just look over there for a second and I'll take the pressure off. And, uh, and, and so but that pressure, instead of that horse hiding, going, I'm, uh, I'm under pressure, I can't do anything, the horse actually went and thought about something different. And because it thought about something different, then that thought, and thinking something different becomes an opportunity. But that thinking something different is it looking at another horse going, I might step over there or just going, oh, what's over there? Um, and then under pressure, that horse starts to make a decision. Um, so that's the sense of fighting fire with fire, opposed to looking at a really braced horse and getting it to relax and relax till it finally just lets go of that, tr that trouble and just gets into a relaxed state. Um, the thing about it is, is we're not working young horses. So when that, that, that troubled horse that you finally relax and it just relax and it licks and licks and chews, it connects with us, gets into a relaxed state. Well, we've relaxed it, but when it's under pressure or feels traumatized, it may just go back to its response that it's done for years. So we, you know, we haven't taught it how to think through trauma. We've only taught it, we've brought the trauma, we've taken it away from trauma. That's the problem is if we take them away from trauma, get them calm again, sometimes when they go back to trauma, they're not set up to deal with that trauma. So um, it'd be like saying to somebody, like a psychologist saying to somebody, you know, hey, okay, I can see you're really troubled. How about you just build a house on an island where you don't have to deal with the world and that's how you're going to be happy. Well, that's not going to help the person because they can't afford an island and they live in a, an apartment and it's a busy apartment and um, there's a lot of conflict around their neighborhood and it's unreal. You can't do that. So, so that person has to learn little steps of dealing in that environment of conflict that they live in, how to empower themselves and start to calm down and, and, and um, make um, active conscious uh, decisions that make them feel better in that environment. And, and so a psychologist or psych would, would actually be trying to empower the person through little steps that they can change or make to help them deal with the life that they live in, not change their life. And I think sometimes by relaxing horses a lot and not empowering them through pressure, we actually are showing them that we control anxiety, but we'll just take it away when they're anxious instead of maybe setting it up that they find a, a, a solution through um, graded levels of I guess, trauma, I suppose we grade the level of trauma and we watch the horse's thought process. And when we see it make a sort of positive answer there, then, then the horse did something for itself and then it tipped its own worry out, which then that empowers the horse to deal with that trauma. So later on, when it goes back in that place, that actually was the place that originally sort of started the big problem, um, then it's more likely to make better decisions. So I can sort of see that, um, you know, uh, just say an an average person out there who has a horse um and not influenced by any trainers or horsemanship they just ride their horse and in their mind horses are able you know they've been bred to cope with a certain level of pressure and you ride them in a certain way so that they're safe and so that inevitably means that you're putting all these um, requests on them and at the end of the day you're the boss you've got to make sure that they're safe they're not going to react when you pull that rein yeah. But then you realize that your horse is unhappy, shut down, um, braced, whatever, and it's withholding a lot of worry, anxiety, and of course that can escalate and overfill and sometimes that can make people realize there's an issue. But anyway, you come to this point where you realize, ah, my horse needs something different. This isn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then, then you know, you come along and... Um, instead of you wanting to um, control the situation, which is basically what's happened up until this point, it's, it's us controlling everything that has possibly, that's led to this horse becoming what mm -hmm. it is. And so now you're saying, no, we're going to take a step back. I mean, obviously we're influencing what's happening, but it, instead of the focus being on us doing this and the horse being a mechanical, a mechanical response, you're allowing the horse to um, have... Uh, its own sort of say to do its own movements to show its own emotions and that's fundamentally completely different from what was happening before that then enables the horse to transform from yep. this shutdown state to a different yep. state so, right? so i guess i guess what happens is um, we're enabling a horse to have a voice um, but 
some people think that enabling a horse to have a voice is just through us listening to them and, uh, right. and then the horse has a voice. So if you've got a horse that, uh, you know, like approach and retreat, okay, classic example, approach and retreat, you approach a horse, the horse gets a little hard, uh, hard expression, carry some anxiety as you walk up. If you just walk up to it, then it starts to shut down and go, they don't listen, I don't communicate, I'm just going to shut down and go hard, they're going to bridle me and that's where the, the, the shutdown process might start, okay. Is if you, but if you did a bit of approach and retreat and you approached that horse and it hardened a little and then you waited and it see it soften and then you step back, the horse is going, geez, this bloke's listening to me. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I might, you know, I might get interested in them and then they start to have a voice. So they start to communicate. Okay. So that's, that's a principle that, you know, I call it approach and retreat. There's different scientific names might be used or different, you know, things over the, the people, words that people use to, to say it, but basically, um, using approach and retreat. Now, the thing with approach and retreat, um, it's really good for approaching horses and we have to do that when we approach some horses that are shut down and stuff like that. But it's when they're under pressure and the thing, and that we're applying pressures and things like that in a learning environment, in a horse lope, out on a ride, whatever, that, that have we set them up to think under that pressure. Um, so, and, and sometimes I think, um, there's two ways of going about it. We can use some, sometimes people overuse approach and retreat to help a horse with trauma. So what I mean is, um, so say once upon a time, a horse might've been flooded with a saddle blanket. So what I mean is the, the person might wave the saddle blanket until the horse uh, moves, moves, moves. And when the feet stop, they take the saddle blanket away. So basically when that horse tries all avenues of making a decision uh, they don't work, but the one that works is just stop. So the horse just stops. But then that's when sometimes that horse is going to start to stop searching is I just start stop my feet. And obviously that's one of those things that are going to put a, a freeze in a horse because you still pick up a saddle blanket. They might have still been worried about the saddle blanket, but as long as they stand still, um, that's the best option. Yeah. So you potentially teach them not to search and to stand still. But then some people will go, well, I'm going to do the opposite of that. And I'm going to listen to my horse. I'm going to approach it with the saddle blanket. And I'm going to sort of, you know, stop when it's nervous. And, and then slowly what happens as you stop when it's nervous, step back a little bit, then come in again, that horse's boundary or bubble gets smaller until it sniffs the saddle blanket and you can put the saddle blanket on. So that's two extreme examples of how we could put a sat. What I mean extreme is it's at the, uh, the opposite. Not, they're both, mm. at the, uh, both at the different ends of the playing field. So, mm. uh, so I'm kind of saying, well, hang on a minute. If you, do that one where you flood them well of course you're going to make your horse shut down um and freeze and but if you do that approach and retreat all the time then one day you're going to be out and there's a kangaroo that's going to start to hop and then oh gee where's my kangaroo button i've lost it uh oh i don't have the kangaroo stop hop button so the problem with the approach and retreat side of it where you're not empowering the horses under pressure in a sense is What's happening is when you're walking up to your horse, you're turning the pressure off. So when the horse gets anxious, you see that anxiety and you go, let's stop time for a second until you come back a bit. And then you start time again and then you go again until the horse goes, I'm okay with this. The problem is, is um, you're actually, con you're, the horse gets anxious and you're controlling its anxiety by you doing something. You haven't got the horse to do much to help it with that anxiety. You've done something the whole right. time. And all yes. the horse had to do was show you it was anxious. And then you did something and took its anxiety off it. So you were the helper the whole time to make that horse accept the saddle blanket. I don't think the horse did enough to go, I can think through a bit of trouble and then accept a saddle blanket as well. So um, I'm saying if you go down the opposite approach too many times with your horse, then one day you will need a stop time button because when there's things happening around you and the horse gets anxious and you can't turn it off because that's what it potentially you've done with your horse by taking away the anxiety, you're saying, I can turn it off. And then when you can't turn it off, the horse goes, uh Oh, I'm out of here. I'm in trouble. Okay. So you, you know, so what you do you do? What's well, the, what's the... what say I'll go back to the saddle blanket scenario. Yes. Um, just to make it a simple scenario, I guess I could talk about the philosophy of it and people get lost. Uh, you know, and, and then I've got lost people and lost horses. <laughs> um, but so the saddle blanket scenario, I walk up to the horse. Now I've taught the horse to lead a bit by then. I might get the saddle blanket at a distance. I get big with it and I shake it and the horse goes, whoa, true, that's a bit scary. And I say, well, it's okay, it's at a distance. And then I say, well, why don't you step forward a bit with the, with the lead rope? And the horse steps forward a little bit 
Um, and then I might soften the saddle blanket and just soften and say, you just did something. You just followed the feel of that rain. And by thinking through that, you actually controlled a bit of the pressure in the saddle blanket. Okay. Now I'm not saying the saddle blanket is going to stop all the time or the kangaroos are going to stop, but the horse had to do something a little bit more and it had to make a decision. And that decision required it to follow the feel of a rain, for instance, which is obviously the common thing that you're going to do when you can't stop that kangaroo from bouncing. You're going to go, well, let's steer over here uh, and follow the field to follow the field to safety. Yeah. So um, the horse ends up following a feel and then you might take the pressure out of the saddle blanket. But then I might do something big with the saddle blanket, get the horse to follow the feel a bit. And then the saddle blanket softens a little bit and the horse goes, oh, I see, I under pressure, I followed that. So they get more interested in following a feel or, um, and they do something for themselves. And then the saddle blanket might quieten a bit until they go, well, I'm not so worried about the saddle blanket because I haven't escaped from it. So because I haven't escaped from it, it's not as dangerous as I thought it was. And then you might go, I'm going to ask you to lead while I keep shaking the saddle blanket. And the horse goes, oh, I'm a bit nervous. I'm a bit nervous. But then they'll start to soften and follow the feel of the lead rope and, and go towards it with their thoughts. And then when they're going towards it with their thoughts, they soften a little and you keep the saddle blanket going a bit while they're soft. And then you might say, now we might just stop. See, you didn't die. And the horse goes, wow, I just did that and I didn't die. Um, that lead rope kind of led me to safety a couple of times at the start. But now it's starting to sort of, you know, I trust it because... Um, I followed it till I felt better. So the other thing you can do, you know, is is show them that if they're scared, they could move off that saddle blanket a little bit um, to show them they can move off it a little bit as well instead of just stand and freeze because by moving off it, then you can always offer them to come back to it. But if a horse without a question, as in we haven't asked a question, should be empowered to make a slight decision to slightly step away from something it's, it's bothered by, and then in education, we say, now you can step away from it. Can you come back to it? And they go, oh, right. Well, if something approached me that I was really frightened of, if I stepped away, that's okay. Because that, that takes panic out of a horse when they can actually make a small decision early opposed to a big decision late. So, and then you might get them to step off that saddle blanket and then come back to it. And then eventually you lead them up underneath the saddle blanket. And what I tend to do with things like that is I stand really still and or still as I can or draw the horse with my feet moving backwards. And I get them to come into those scary things and I can rub them over with those scary things like the saddle blanket, the saddle, belly rope, all that sort of stuff. So what that's sort of doing is it's getting the horse to do something, think something and follow a feel under pressure versus the pressure goes away and then comes back and they just have to stand there and do nothing except show us emotion. Do you think also that while all this is happening that you're establishing your relationship on a different way as well in, in oh, yeah. that the horse can see you more as someone that they'll they'll trust I mean surely I mean you're you're getting them to understand a lot of what you do is getting them to understand the the feel of a rope and to make sure that they're yeah. going towards their thoughts yeah. but isn't there at the end of the day are they also associating the feel with you and knowing yes. that that's okay yeah no they feel and, and and then when they do something soft obviously you put your hand out they sniff on you they're, they're connected with you they're feeling good and they go well I'm still with company and the person's still around me and I'm okay and I've, I've just accepted a saddle blanket that's not going to kill me. I'm okay about it. Um, now, the other thing too is um, a lot of people do spend a lot of time connecting with their horses, but what friend are you going to follow in an emergency? You know, you know, there's some friends that you like to go and have a glass of wine or a beer with, but you're not going to go to Afghanistan with them. And, and that's the thing is so when we offer a horse a pathway of leadership that helps them feel better, then we can also be around to help them in an emergency. And they see us as a good leader that makes good decisions that they actually trust some of our decisions uh, through, through, you know, certain levels of, you know, trauma and stuff like that. Whereas if we just sit in, you know, in a quiet place and have them nice and connected, it's all good. It's all part of the equation, but we have to be the leader that provides them with good answers when they're in trouble. It makes them feel better, not just, not just one that says I can just turn off the trouble. Um, so, you know, to me, like if you look at like a herd situation, okay, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put this back in a herd situation so people can understand it a bit more in a, psych a herd, psychological sense from how they deal in herds. But so basically uh, a horse goes, oh, there's, a, there's an echidna walking along on the ground. It doesn't have to alert the whole herd for that, but every horse in the herd is allowed to go, oh, that's scary. Oh, I might walk away from that. Oh, I don't know, whatever. 
one horse might see an echidna and just bolt from a mile. And, okay, yeah. I just have to interrupt for, for everyone that, does, that lives outside of Australia. An echidna is a small sort of um, plate-sized spiky object, a bit like a hedgehog. Okay, it calls yes, them ground. Yes, tiny anteater. <laughs> uh, so anyway, they, they're quite cool. and um, They cut up into a Anyway, ball, they yeah. might see that, but they don't have to alert the whole herd. But when there's a thrill, danger or a threat around, there's a horse that makes... So, so when you look at horses, they don't just go in this flight response and run off like mice. Um, in a sense, if there's a real threat, then a confident leader herd, like the leader says, well, I'm going to go this way and lead to safety. And the horses go, good idea. We're going to follow you. So that's what's happening. There's a threat. And then someone makes a decision to lead the horses to safety. And that's what training sometimes is about. Like sometimes I might put a flag in the air and go, here's a threat. And the horse goes, gee, there's a threat. What am I going to do? Now, like the echidna, I might allow that horse to step back off the flag a little and go, well, I've just sorted some of that threat out myself, but I'm still a little concerned about it. And then I'll go, well, how about I pick up this lead rope and let's lead across over here. And then the horse goes, oh, good idea. And then I take a little bit of the threat away to show that horse that I just led it to safety or most importantly, what's more important to me is the, is the lead rope. And reason is because we leave the horses with lead ropes when we're not there. The, the lead rope led you to safety. So not only do I become a leader, I'm trying to show the horse that the lead rope and the reins become a leader that helps them guide their thoughts to a better decision. So when the horse goes, I'm lost, you go, don't worry, look over there. And they go, okay, that's a good idea. I'm going to let go of that thought and go over here. And obviously through my training, past my past training, I've started to feel good through making a decision through the question that I've asked or the reins asked, yeah? So the horse is... Um, offered a suggestion that's going to make it feel better while there's some trauma around it like a flag or a neutral scary thing so I do a lot of neutral scary things and say can you search good you can search now can you search into this and they go yeah and then all of a sudden when they search into this they go I felt good uh, and then they recognize that when there's a scary kangaroo that won't stop bouncing if they search into the feel of that rain or the question that I'm asking um, then I'm going to feel better and that becomes their response under pressure to look for where the herd's going and go, I'm going to go with them, yeah? Uh, and that's where the rain's going or myself. All right, so um, I can see that the pressure on the ground with the sense of the lead rate, but you're also talking about reins and you're presumably also talking about legs when you're talking about pressure, that the horse, you know, they need to have comfort in these tools that yeah. we're using. So, so basically that's why every tool that we use, going back to that first thing that we were talking about, about, you know, directing a horse's thought, is everything we do with a horse get is potentially going to get them to let go of a thought. So, um, you know, when I'm using the reins or my legs, like later on legs are to say go faster or more impulsion, but usually the most clear thing to get a horse to let go of a thought and take on a new thought is usually more through the reins in the start than, than the other aids. So, you know, but you can start to get a stage with horses that when the horse is thinking, uh, that you can get a forward thought with just two legs and the horse searches and goes forward with two legs um, so they can move forward. Uh, if they're just thinking on pressure and moving away from the legs, then they're actually not letting go of a thought. They're still thinking backwards going forward so they still can carry worry. Um, so, But every one of those tools that we're kind of asking is, is, is ultimately somewhat helping a horse letting go of something that's thinking to take on something else. So because... Uh, in our training, we're mostly getting a horse to let go of something and then offer it something new. Uh, the first thing that happens when we do something with our body, our, our reins, the horse lets go of that to take on board what we're asking and what we're asking leads it somewhere else, which helps it tip out the anxiety because it's not fixated on the scary thing anymore. It's fixated on the opportunity of a new direction or something like that or a connection with us. Sometimes you might just redirect them back to us just to help them a little bit, but uh, in a riding scenario, you're not going to be there in front of them. You're going to get them to lead themselves into a place of safety. So you both go together. Okay. Um, so so just going back to the reins then um, and the legs, do, adding adding pressure, um, the application of pressure, is mm -hmm. that more important then than the release of pressure so that we can get to where we want to be? Yeah, like the application of pressure is kind of like, to me, really important. People sort of, you know, oh, and the intention behind pressure. I had a conversation at the last clinic about this. I said, now, in the past, I've 
this horse has had this much pressure was a horse that was frightened of pressure and and um and tends to have certain responses to pressure that were were quite negative and and not good for its mind and but I said at this clinic I'm going to apply just as much pressure on this horse that's been applied on it in the past and sometimes maybe more um but the intention behind this pressure is completely different so the intention behind the pressure will soften the horse and whereas the pressure applied before was worrying the horse so even it got to a stage that even a little bit of pressure worried it whereas um we get them to a stage that the pressure gets them to search it doesn't constantly make them go to full worry all the time even little bits so so basically what i was saying is the intention behind my pressure is to get this horse to let go of a hard thought not hang on to a hard thought so uh, and also the intention like some people say i'm i'm intending my pressure to push into you and make you go away from me and then i might add pressure and the same amount of pressure with the flag or do something but my intention wasn't to say go away and that horse goes oh thanks i can cope with pressure now because pressure always was directed at me personally and i was worried about it because it was directed at me personally all the time not just directed into the air for Mm -hmm. me to make a decision and that's why people sort of get mixed up with pressure so someone might go he's applying just as much pressure as that other person i'll be going but yeah but the horse is softening because the intention behind the pressure is completely different and that that one pressure empowers a horse the other one disempowers it uh so it's not you know let's just soften because some people go i'm a soft trainer i'm really soft and i'm like well that's good but where's your intention and what's your intention with your horse um because sometimes people just go softer but their intention is still the same so the horse is still worried um opposed to if they got bigger and had a different intention and and that's such a big topic in itself and you know in the in the way that the horses are so perceptive to our emotions and our intentions as you said and um Mm -hmm. you know if if someone if someone walks into a room and they're angry we all know that and yet they don't necessarily have said something or done something we all just feel it so and it's the same i suppose with a horse um, and, you know, that idea that uh, going back to right at the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about sort of the average rider might go out and, and get a mechanical response. Well, they're not um, they're not being aware of themselves and their intentions. But if we are, then, you know, it can we can be so much more effective. And this is a whole sort of new wave of, of this horsemanship. We can't really use the natural horsemanship banner. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is just about having perhaps emotional horsemanship might be more appropriate. Because you're sort of well, it is, it, is emo- it, it, it is emotional. It's, it, it's just um, like it's just a form of I call it horsemanship. Because I didn't know what name to, carry. but I never called it natural horsemanship because I didn't want to be coined with what was commonly you know the program natural horsemanship that we used to see all the time, and and a lot of that used to get the horses just to merely move away from pressure, uh, not necessarily go towards their thoughts. But the whole concept originally of horsemanship that Tom Dorrance used to talk about, it was, it was there mm. to help our horses um, feel good about what they were doing. Mm. And, and I, tended, I tend to think that if we went back and looked at what he was trying to talk about, we should be looking where he was looking, not what, not, what, not what everyone started doing, but where he was looking and some of those good sayings that got people to really think about, you know, is our horse feeling good about what it's doing? You know, he might not have directly talked about a horse always going towards his thoughts and this in his training, but... All you have to look at is he's saying is get a horse to follow a feel. If he wanted everyone to get a horse to move away from pressure, he would have said get a horse to move away from a feel, not follow a feel. The whole word itself, follow a feel, means a horse is going towards his thoughts from the feel of our intention, not moving away from our intention, yeah? And uh, so, um, you know, to me it's like, well, he, he, he had the message and he delivered it, but unfortunately it got diluted with um, a bit of poison along the way, I suppose. Um, so I think we should be looking at still those old things. That, is the horse feeling good about what's it, what it's doing? Is it following a feel? Um, are we empowering it? Like I like, to, I like to talk about empowerment a lot because are we empowering our horse to stand in that horse float and survive that journey or are we just teaching it to go into a horse float? Um, and another thing that I'll say a lot to people is I say, well, now that you taught that horse how to get into trouble, have you taught it how to get out of trouble? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, you, you got that horse to go in a horse float but you know you got it to go in very quietly and very relaxed and it gets a little treat every time it goes in there and it feels really good i said you've got it to get into trouble have you got it to get out of trouble and they're like oh i'm not sure what you mean i said well i can give you a ticket to afghanistan and i can sort of make it sound like a nice tour but you're going to get there and you're not going to have any tools when all the shooting starts 
and mm. you're going to get frantic. So, um, you know, if you teach a horse to get into trouble, firstly, you should have taught it to get out of trouble first. So, you know, in partly loading horses, you know, when I load horses, going back to the whole subject of uh, pressure and getting a, fighting fire with fire, I'll, I'll, I'll add a bit of pressure and I'll say, you know, maybe soften, try this or bang the float a few times and make the float a bit of a really sort of a scary thing for a moment. And then they'll look at it and I'll go, oh, but then I might get them to soften a little bit because prior to that, I taught them how to soften to a feel a bit. And then they'll soften and then they'll survive that slightly kind of awkward experience of pressure. And then once they can do that, then all of a sudden when the float starts rattling, now I can deal with that. I can move on that. I can, I can do things while there's pressure around and I can actually... Uh, if the float gets on a bumpy road or they swerve or they jam the brakes on, I've done enough in there to be able to have answers that I can call upon to help myself regulate and, and balance better and in this environment. Whereas if I just got to put the horse in and said, right, oh, lovely, kindly, good horse, shut it in and drove down the road, it's going to go, I don't know what to do now, I'm panicked. Uh, adding pressure is something that seems to be just one element actually of quite a few things um, that are very specific that you're looking for. I mean, our intention is one big thing. Being aware of their emotions is another big thing. And adding the right amount of pressure, you know, that must be so um, so specialised, I suppose, in the right way. You you wouldn't want anyone just picking up a flag, would you, and just trying to stimulate pressure to be able to get a thought change? How hard is it to do? Yeah, you get used to doing it a bit better each day, but it's um, something that, some some levels are, are easy to apply, but some are, some are quite hard. And people at clinics say, like, I mean, for everybody and all the listeners out there, it, it wasn't an easy decision for me to put a video library up for people. Um, I, it's something I, I was uncomfortable about, and it was purely just because of what you said, Jenny, is how easy is it is to apply. Um, and we can do damage. And, and, and once upon a time, I saw many people with many flags that were sold flags like hot cakes and I saw a lot of ruined horses through people using pressure in the wrong way. And uh, so I didn't want to be that trainer that had a following of people that uh, that I taught them how to shut down horses and stuff like that because I sold them a product that I didn't say, hey, are we looking hard enough? So, um, so yes, it is hard. Uh, yes, it is hard to apply pressure sometimes on some horses, especially the chronic cases. Um, yes, it is hard to be centred, so hard to constantly smile and keep your energy grounded, no matter the conflict around you with the horse, the trauma in it, whatever, and stay, still smile and go, I'm here to help. Uh, so I'm very neutral. I try and stay neutral the whole time. Um, so for people who own their own horses, the first thing, them staying neutral is even hard because they've had a history with that horse that comes up straight away as soon as anything big happens. So, you know, even in itself, you know, that's hard enough to control, you know, even... To, then they've got to control pressure around that horse but they're feeling unstable themselves and all the worry and the responsibility on the person comes out and it's and it's quite difficult so you know so then I guess um, what we got to think about is how can I break a little piece down that I can chew on and only not have to do necessarily what I did at a clinic to get a horse through a big brace how can I sort of dissect it a bit and do sort of easier things that the person can do um, so yeah it, it is difficult and and that's why I encourage people when they're looking at the video library is these are uh, like it's a fly on the wall kind of scenario and you have to use an element of discretion and I maybe maybe not do that with my horse and I try and make people think that this is what I'm doing with this particular horse for this reason. This is not just going to do it with every horse. It's like, well, you know, and they have to think about that. But I have to make learning available that gets people to think about we are trying to get horses to feel better. Uh, about what they're doing and things like that and I think because everyone comes on board with a good um, they're coming on board with a good intention even if they didn't quite get the lesson right or they're applying the wrong pressure they're still going in a better direction than they were when they were just sort of saying move its feet get it out on a circle whatever they were doing uh, the horses are still getting softer and, and, and better and and they're, and they're on the road to recovery I suppose so but yeah it's not easy um, I wish sometimes I could just put myself in the person for five minutes just to give them a, 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 a chance to make that change on their horse. But um, like any learning, I tried to ski the other, you know, oh, we started skiing with the kids not so long ago. <laughs> well, you know, a few years ago, and 
I, I was really disheartened after the second day because I was going okay and then I just lost my mojo and I thought I should be easy. I just expected to be able to go and do it and, <laughs> and I just couldn't do it as easy as I wanted to and my frustration was, you know, quite high. Um, but, you know, everything sort of got better and, um, and I had to realise that, you know, it's not that easy. And I explain that to people when I'm teaching them. Um, your horse is like a black slope. Don't expect to sort of be a novice skier on a black slope and just go down and go, well, that was easy. Um, and some people do have horses that feel like they're skiing down a black slope. Uh, and then I try and identify a part of that training that might make it a green slope for them where they can just do a little thing that makes a change on that horse and then slowly, um, you know, they get better and then they can sort of slowly move along a bit further with their horses. That's fantastic. It's been it's been great listening to you, Mark. Thank you very much for breaking that topic down for us. Um, if this has raised any questions um, for any of the listeners out there, do do leave us with a comment. We'd love to hear from you. If there's if we get time, Mark will answer some of the comments as well. Um, but yes, good luck with all your horses out there. I hope this has been helpful. And um, if you're wanting to learn more from Mark, just Google Mark Langley and he'll he'll come up for you. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>